Okay, a brief overview of the mystery of being by Gabriel Marcel, published in 1950. The principal ideas of which are that the peculiar task of philosophy is to describe what it means to be in a particular concrete situation. Existential thinking, the thinking of an individual self, is threatened by the interest in abstractions and by bureaucratic societies which reduce individuals to averages. Primary reflection is analytical, secondary reflection is recuperative, allowing the self to discover its being in action. The immediate encounter with the mystery of being is in terms of a lived participation. Being is an internal relation. The self or the body is not an object of knowledge, but the subject who knows himself as he acts. To know others existentially is to encounter them, not as things, but in acknowledgement of them as persons. Freedom is found when the self turns inward and becomes aware of its capability for commitment and a treason. Gabriel Marcel is one of the main figures associated with existential thought in France. His two-volume work, The Mystery of Being, is the final product of a series of Gifford lectures, which were given in 1949 and 1950 at the University of Aberdeen. Volume 1 is subtitled Reflection and Mystery. The subtitle of Volume 2 is Faith and Reality. Characteristic of the mystery of being, and one might say of Marcel's writings in general, is a philosophical approach which is oriented towards concrete descriptions and elucidations instead of systematic delineations. In this respect, the existential, existentialism of Marcel has greater affinities to the thought of Kierkegaard and Jaspers than to that of Heidegger and Sartre. Marcel will have nothing to do with the system builders. A philosophical system, even though it may have an existential cast, is in Heidegger, as in Heidegger and Sartre, entails for the author a falsification of lived experience as it is immediately apprehended. On every page of Marcel's writing, the reader is forced to acknowledge the author's concentrated efforts to remain within the concrete. Existential thinking is the thinking of the involved self. This involved self is contrasted by the author with the abstracted self. The abstracted self in its movement of detachment escapes to a privileged and intellectually rarefied sanctuary, an Olympus of the spirit, from which it seeks to formulate a global and inclusive perspective of the whole of reality. Marcel's concrete philosophical elucidations express a continuing protest against any such Olympian view. And I quote, There is not and there cannot be any global abstraction, any final terrors to which we can climb by means of abstract thought, there to rest forever. For our condition in this world does remain. In the last analysis, that of a wanderer, an itinerant being, who cannot come to absolute rest except by a fiction, a fiction which it is the duty of philosophic reflection to oppose with all its strength. End quote. Man is an as an itinerant being, or a wayfarer, as the author has expressed it, in the title of another of his works, Homo Vieta, of 1945, is always on the way, passing from one concrete situation to another. At no time can he shed his situationality and view himself and the rest of the world as completed. There is no Denken Überhaupt, which can tear itself loose from the concrete situation of the involved self and lay a claim for universal validity. This, for Marcel, as already for Kierkegaard, is the grievous fault in all varieties of idealism. Idealism fails to recognize the situational character of all human thinking. The philosophical reflection which the author prescribes is a reflection which retains its existential bond with the concrete situation. The peculiar task of philosophy is that of describing what it means to be in a situation. The task is a phenomenological one, phenomenological in the sense that it takes its points of departure 
from everyday lived experience and seeks to follow through the implications which can be drawn from it. Concrete existence is lost in the abstract movements of a detached reflection, but it is also threatened by the pervasive bureaucratization of modern life. In the chapter entitled A Broken World, Marcel develops a penetrating analysis of the disillusion of personality in the face of increased social regimentation. Man stands in danger of losing his humanity. Our modern hum bureaucratized world tends to identify the individual with the state's official record of his activities. Personality is reduced to an identity card. In such a situation, man is defined in terms of replaceable functions rather than acknowledged as a unique and irreplaceable self. Creative activities are standardized and consequently depersonalized. Everything, including man himself, is reduced to a stultifying law of averages in one passages. The author speaks of an uh, equality which is obtained by a process of leveling down to a point where all creativity vanishes. The language and theme are reminiscent of Kierkegaard's social critique in the present age of 1846, in which he indicted the public for having effected a leveling process that virtually made the category of the individual extinct. This theme of depersonalization also links Marcel with the two German existentialists, Jaspers and Heidegger. Jaspers, in his book Man in the Modern Age, 1931, has described how the masses have become our masters and reduced everything to an appalling mediocrity. Heidegger, in his notion of Das Mann, has expressed basically the same theme in a later work, Man Against Mass Society, of 1952, Marcel gives special attention to this phenomenon, elucidating it in, the, in a descriptive analysis which is rich and penetrating. The leading question in Marcel's philosophy of the concrete is the question, who am I? Only through a pursuit of this question can man be liberated from the objectivizing and tendencies in modern thought and return to the immediacy of his lived experience. Reflection will illuminate this lived experience only as long as it remains part of his life. The author defines two levels of reflection, primary and secondary. Primary reflection is analytical and tends to dissolve the unity of experience as it is existentially disclosed to the involved self. Secondary reflection is recuperative and seeks to reconquer the unity that is lost to primary reflection. It is only with the aid of secondary reflection that man can penetrate to the depths of the self. The Cartesian cogito is derived by primary reflection, and therefore it is viewed as a mental object somehow united with the fact of existence. But this abstract reflection is already at a second remove from the reality of pure immediacy. If the eye exists is to provide the Archimedean point, then it will need to be retrieved in its indissoluble unity as an immediate datum of secondary reflection. Existence, as Kant has already shown in his Critique of Pure Reason of 1781, is not a property or a predicate which can be attached to a mental object. Existence indicates an irreducible status in a given sensory context. Secondary reflection uncovers my existence as it is sensibly experienced in act. This apprehension of my existence in act is what Marcel calls the existential indubitable. In asking about myself, I am disclosed as the questioner in the very act of posing the question. It is here that we find ourselves up against existence in its naked thereness. The living body is for the author a central phenomenon in secondary or recuperative reflection. Secondary reflection discloses my existence as an unincarnated existence. An existence which is tied to a body which I experience as peculiarly and uniquely my own. The existential indubitable is manifested in the experience of my body as it actually lives. Primary reflection tends to dissolve the link between me and my body. It transforms the me into a universal consciousness and my body 
into an objectified entity, which is in fact only one body among many others. The original unity of the experience of myself as body is thus dissolved. Primary reflection takes up the attitude of an objectivizing detachment. The body becomes an anatomical or physiological object, generalized as a datum for scientific investigation. It becomes evident that the Cartesian dualism of mind and body springs from primary rather than secondary reflection. The body in Descartes' philosophy is the substantive entity which has been objectivized and viciously abstracted from the concrete experience of the living body as intimately mine. Secondary reflection apprehends my body as an irreducible determinant in my immediate experience. On the one hand, my body is disclosed as something which I possess, something that belongs to me. But as I penetrate deeper, I find that the analogy of ownership does not succeed in fully expressing the incarnated quality of my existence. The analogy of ownership still tends to define the relationship of myself to my body as an external one. It defines my body as a possession which is somehow accidental to my inner being. But this is not so. My body is constitutive of my inner being. Properly speaking, it is not something which I have. It designates who I am. And I quote, My body is my body, just in so far as I do not consider it in this detached fashion, do not put a gap between myself and it. To put this point in another way, my body is mine in so far as for me my body is not an object for, but rather, I am my body. End quote. It is at this point that the author's distinction between being and having becomes relevant. The phenomenon of being can never be reduced to the phenomenon of having. In having, the bond between the possessor and the possessed is an external relation. In the phenomenon of being, the bond is an internal rather than external one, and is expressed by Marcel in the language of participation. Man has or possesses external objects and qualities, but he participates in being. The implications of this philosophy of this phenomenological distinction for the immediate awareness of the living body are evident. On one level of experience, my body is something which I have to possess. It is a material complex which is attached to myself and defines me as a self with a body. But on a deeper level of experience, I am my body, and I am my body in such a way that the simple materiality of my body as a possession is transcended. I exist as a body, as an incarnated being for whom the experience of body and the experience of selfhood are inseparable, inseparable phenomena. Speaking of my body is a way of speaking of myself. The body is such a view, in such a view is externalized. The body in such a view is existentialized. It is no longer an object possessed by a subject. It is apprehended as a determinant of subjectivity. The immediate encounter with the mystery of being is thus in terms of a lived participation. The idea of participation, says the author, had taken on importance for him even in the days of his earliest philosophical gropings. Although the language of participation would seem to betray a platonic influence, the author makes it clear that the idea of participation includes more than an intellectual assent. Indeed, the foundational mode of participation is feeling inextricably bound up, as we have seen, with a bodily sense. The platonic dualism of mind and body with its, perver with its pervervid intellectualism and depreciation of the senses could not admit the existential quality of participation which, Mar which Marcel seeks to establish. Marcel's Favourite illustrations of feeling as a mode of participation are his illustrations of the link between the peasant and the soil and the sailor and the sea. Here he says we can grasp what participation means. The peasant's attachment to the soil and the sailor's attachment to the sea transcend all relationships of simple utility. The peasant does not have the soil as a simple possession, the soil becomes a part of his being. He becomes existentially identified with the soil. A separation of himself from the soil 
would entail a loss of identity and a kind of incurable internal bleeding. This, born through participation expressed in the link between the peasant and the soil, points to the fundamental relation of man to the mystery of being. In Marcel's philosophy of participation, the notions of intersubjectivity, encounter and community are decisive. In the second volume of The Mystery of Being, the author seeks to replace the Cartesian metaphysics of I think with a metaphysics of intersubjectivity which is formulated in terms of we are. Philosophical reflection, he argues, must anticipate its inquiry from the solipsism of an isolated epistemological subject or a transcendental ego. My existence is disclosed only in the context of a living communication with other selves. The more I free myself from the prison of egocentrism, concludes the author, the more do I exist. Embedded in all my existential reflections as is a preliminary and precognitive awareness of a communal horizon of which I am inextricably a part. And I quote, I concern myself with being only insofar as I have a more or less distinct consciousness of the underlying unity which ties me to other beings of whose reality I have all I already have a preliminary notion. End quote. The basic phenomenon of communal intersubjectivity is further elucidated in the author's use of the notion of encounter. The intersubjectivity of human life becomes apparent only in the movements of personal encounter. Now the phenomenon of personal encounter a relationship which is qualitatively diverse from that which obtains in a relationship between physical objects on the level of singhood. Selfhood and singhood constitute distinct modes of being correspondingly requiring different modes of apprehension or knowledge. Another human self cannot be encountered as a thing. Every human self is a... is a thou... And must, I nearly said not then, I can't read my own handwriting. Every human self is a thou, and must be encountered as a personal centre of subjectivity. Only through encounter does one attain knowledge of another self. The French verb reconnoitre is peculiarly suited to express the movement of encountering. The range of meaning in reconnoitre Reconnaître is restricted if it is translated in its usual manner as to recognize. The French usage denotes acknowledgement as well as recognition. In an encounter, another self is known when he is acknowledged as a person. Knowledge is acknowledgement. Allied with notions of the encounter and reconnaître are the notions of de Disponibility and indisponibility, which are elucidated at some length in a previous work by Marcel, Lettre et Navoir, Avoir, Being and Having of 1949. The two notions have been rendered into English respectively as availability and unavailability. Marcel suggests, however, that it would be more natural if one spoke of handiness and unhandiness. The self centered person is unhandy. He does not make himself and his resources available to other selves. He remains encumbered with himself. He insensitive to openness and transparency. He is incapable of sympathizing with other people. And he lacks a requisite fellow feeling for understanding their situation. I quote. He remains shut up in himself in a petty circle of his private experience, which forms a kind of hard shell round him, that he is incapable of breaking through. He is unhandy from his own point of view and unavailable from the point of view of others. End quote. The handy and available self is that self who can transcend his private individual life and become open to a creative communion with other selves. He is ever ready to respond in love and sympathy, no longer enclosed upon himself. He acknowledges the inner freedom as subjectivity of the other, 
and thus reveals both himself and the other as something other than object. It is Marcel's accentuation of the theme of creative intersubjectivity which most clearly contrasts his existential reflections with those of his fellow countrymen, Jean-Paul Sartre. In the existentialism of Sartre, the final movement culminates in a disharmonious and alienating egocentrism. In the existentialism of Marcel, the last measure and note is one of harmony, creative communality. The existential reflections in the author's two-volume work are geared to an elucidation of various facets of the presence of being. Being disclosed itself as a mystery, hence the appropriate title of his lectures, The Mystery of Being. In the concluding chapter of Volume 1, the author erects a signpost for the philosophical wayfarer to help him in his metaphysical journeyings. This signpost is the distinction between problem and mystery. A mystery is something in which I myself am involved, the problem is something from which I detach myself and seek to solve. One is involved in mystery, but one, invo one solves problems. Mystery has to do with the experience of presence. Problem has to do with the realm of objects which can be grasped through the determination of an objectifying reason. A problem is subject to an appropriate technique. It can be diagrammed, quantified and manipulated. A mystery by its very character transcends every determinable technique. Being is a mystery rather than a problem, and the moment that it is reduced to a problem, its significance vanishes. By turning a mystery into a problem, one degrades it. When the mystery of the being of the self is subject to a problematic approach, which by definition objectivizes its content, then the personal and subjective quality of selfhood is dissolved. When the mystery of evil is translated into a problem of evil, as is the case in most theodicies, then the issue is so falsified as to render impossible any existentially relevant illumination. In advancing his distinction between mystery and problem, however, Marcel is not delineating between is not delineating a distinction between the unknowable and the knowable. In fact, the unknowable belongs to the domain of the problematic. It points to the limiting horizon of that which can be conceived through objective techniques. The recognition of mystery involves a positive act of responsiveness on the part of self. It expresses a knowledge which is peculiar to its content. An immediate knowledge of participation as contrasted with an objectivizing knowledge of detachment. Knowledge is attainable both in the domain of mystery and in the domain of problem, but the knowledge in each case is irreducibly adapted in its intentional content. In volume two, the author concludes his philosophical reflections by showing that his philosophy of being is at the same time a philosophy of freedom. Although the notion of freedom is not given as much attention in the existential of Marcel as in that of Kierkegaard, Jaspers and Sartre, it plays a significant role in his elucidation of concrete experience. Freedom is disclosed in the domain of mystery rather than in the domain of problem. Freedom can never be found in a series of external acts. Freedom is found only when the self turns inward and becomes aware of its capacity for commitment and treason. Freedom is disclosed in the subjective movements of promise and betrayal. I am free to, to bind myself in a promise, and then I am free to betray the one who has take, taken me into his trust. Freedom is thus disclosed in both its creative and destructive implications. Both fidelity and treason are expressions of a free act. This freedom, which is experienced only in concreto, moves within the mystery of man's inner subjectivity. As a problem, freedom can be nothing more than a series of objectively observable psychological states. As a mystery, freedom constitutes the inner core of the self. There is an inner connection between faith and freedom, 
In volume two, which the author has subtitled Faith and Reality, this inner connection is elaborated. Faith is itself a movement of freedom in the establishment of bonds of commitment, both with one's fellow man and with God. Faith is thus described as trust rather than an intellectual assent to propositional truth. Marcel distinguishes between believing that and believing too. Sorry. Marcel distinguishes between believing that and believing in. Faith is not a matter of believing that. It is not oriented toward propositions which correspond to some objective reality. Faith is expressed through believing in. To believe in another person is to place confidence in him. In effect, this is to say to the other, I am sure that you will not betray my hope, that you will respond to it, that you will fulfill it. Also, to have faith in God is to establish a relationship of trust in Him. Man is free to enter into a covenant with God, invoking a bond of trust and commitment, but he is also free to betray Him and revoke the covenant. Faith and freedom disclose the need for transcendence. Transcendence for the author is not simply a horizontal transcendence of going beyond in time, as it is for Heidegger and Sartre. Transcendence has a verbal dimension as well, a going beyond to the eternal. The experience of transcendence is fulfilled only through participation in the life of a transcendent being. Marcel's philosophy of being, unlike that of Heidegger and Sartre, is not simply a philosophy of human finitude. It seeks to establish a path which reaches beyond the finite and temporal to the transcendent and eternal.